Hey friends, it is Ben again. This is a video for the vector calculus class and we are going to take a look at parametric surfaces. This may be the longest video of the semester um, because I'm going to try to give you plenty of examples of this. Okay. And then with regard to saying that, um, it occurs to me that I should have opened up a bunch of windows that I may be going to share with you and have uh, done a bunch of graphs ahead of time. And uh, as you might guess, I didn't. So we'll just see how this goes. All right. So uh, when we talk about parametric surfaces, what you need to think about sort of um, structurally is that if you have a curve, it is a one-dimensional sort of thing. It is determined by one choice, one variable. So if you have something that is living on the plane, <clears throat> you may have x equals a function of t and y equals a function of t. It may seem like there's three variables there, but only one of them is the independent variable, okay? If you were looking at, at a line or curve on the plane that was given to you by y equals a function of x or some combination of x's and y's, the thing that you've got going on is that there are two variables, but one equation, which removes one of your choices, okay? And so that means that you only have one choice left. It's something one-dimensional. <clears throat> Whereas if you do something parametric on the plane, it seems like you've got three variables. You will have two equations, x equals a function of t, y equals a function of t. And so the two equations remove two of your choices. Okay. So <clears throat> when we look at parameterizing surfaces, we are going to think about having two variables that are choices. And then your x and your y and your z are going to be determined by those two variables. I'll usually use s and t or u and v or r and theta or who the hell knows, okay? But <clears throat> there's a place that you need to start with from this of realizing that if we're parameterizing, there's a reason for parameterizing if we could accomplish everything by just saying z equals f of xy, then we would just do that. And we wouldn't ever bother with any of this parametric crap, you know? So try not to approach every problem by just plugging in x equals u, y equals v, and then z equals whatever the hell it turns out to be. Sometimes that works. <clears throat> a lot, maybe even a lot of times that works but there's cases where it doesn't. In particular, if you're talking about circles, parameterize them with sine and cosine. If you're talking about hyperbolas, parameterize them with hyperbolic sine and cosine, okay? So I prepared a little kind of a sheet here, and if I can find my mouse again, I will share with y'all, assuming that the screen wants to mirror this morning, one, two, three, go. Yay, it's going to mirror. All right. So this is just a little bit of a primer here on your parametric surfaces. So if you've got z equals f of x, y, lots of times you can parameterize it just by saying, I'm going to have x and y be my parameters and then do this f of x, y. Likewise, if you had y equals f of x, z, or if you had x equals f of y, z, you could do something similar, okay? Now, if we're going to talk about parameterizing a plane, I think this starts to illustrate the sort of thing that we have to think of doing. If you've got a plane, and then you can identify one point on it and identify two directions to go in. Ideally, those directions would be orthogonal to each other because if they're orthogonal, it makes it a, a really efficient way to represent these things. But 
they don't have to be orthogonal. In fact, if you look back historically, I'm sorry, I'm going to go off on a tangent. Uh, historically, and you talk about Cartesian coordinates, well, the Cartesian coordinates <clears throat> uh, were developed by Rene Descartes. They are perpendicular to each other, but at the same time, Pierre de Fermat, the guy from Fermat's last theorem, uh, was also looking at a, at a different way of doing Cartesian coordinates, and he saw no reason to make them perpendicular to each other. So, um, <clears throat> Cartesian coordinates won out because they're they're easier to work with. But now, if I want to have any other point on the plane, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe this over here, Q, then I can go from P, some multiple of V, or maybe it's a multiple of V plus a multiple of Q, and that is the reason why we do this SU and TV, okay? So, um, yeah, I, should, I will look at an example here in a minute where we're doing that sort of thing. Uh, and we'll look at it, an actual picture of it. But if you wanted to do an ellipse, uh, and this is a curve, right? So any sort of ellipse, you can identify two directions like that and just multiply cosine theta and sine theta by that u and that v. And as the theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, it's going to then transcribe a circle in the plane determined by u and v. Right? The reason why that works out for parameterizing is this nice thing here of cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1 and then that is similar to having an equation, x squared plus y squared equals one. Now, if you want a different radius, and in particular, if you want it to be an ellipse and have radii pointing in other directions, then you, um, then you want to have some coefficients going on here and so forth, but uh, that's a little beyond what we're really going to try to talk about, okay? So just in general, ellipses are going to be parameterized with identify two vectors and multiply them by sine and cosine. Hyperbolas, on the other hand, have equations like x squared minus y squared equals one, and the hyperbolic sine and cosine have the property that they obey that, that sort of equation, okay? So likewise, if you are going to uh, do something that's a hyperbola, then you can talk about the u and v directions and multiply by hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine, okay? The thing that you need to uh, spot, though, is that hyperbolic cosine of t is always going to be greater than or equal to 1, uh, whereas the hyperbolic sine of t is going to go to negative infinity and positive infinity. I guess really I ought to have written this. Um, is that right? Yeah, okay. I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write that. And in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right, okay. So, <clears throat> so in any case though, when you're doing this parameterization, and you need to think about doing a leaf of a hyperbola. If the hyperbola is opening out there in the x direction, that means that the x part is always greater than or equal to 1 or whatever it is that you're working with. And so that's why that one uh, would have the cosh in the x direction. And because it needed to go up and down forever, it would have the cinch in the y direction. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're going to do some quick parameterizations here. And, uh, um, and then maybe I'll jump over to Desmos and graph them real quick to show what's going on. So with regard to this first one, you can see that the coefficients of x squared and y squared are both positive. And that suggests that we're going to have something that's an ellipse, right? 
if one of them is positive and one is negative, then you're going to have something that's a hyperbola. So for our purposes here, we're going to have to do some completing the square. So I'm going to just reserve a little bit of room to do this. And I can see with the 2x squared and the 12x, if I factor out the 2, then I have a minus 6x. And the 12y, I'll factor out the 3 and have a plus 4y. So to complete this square, I have to add 9. And that means on the other side, I have to add 18. And to complete this square, I have to add 4. And that means on the other side, I have to add 12. So that means I have 2 times x minus 3 squared plus 3 times y plus 2 squared um, is equal to 36. So if I go ahead and divide there, then I will have x minus 3 squared divided by 18 plus y plus 2 squared divided by um, 12, okay, is equal to 1. Now I've forced it into the form where it looks like cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. So now I'm going to let my x minus three over the square root of 18. Let's see, that's three square root of two. That's gonna be cosine theta. And then I'm gonna let the y plus two over, let's see, that's two square roots of three. It's gonna be the sine of theta. So if I solve there, and I realize that I should not have shoved two of these onto one page, I'll try to fix that in the notes that I give you all though. Uh, but if I solve for the x there, I will end up with three minus three root two cosine theta. And the y, I will end up with a minus two minus two root three sine theta, okay? Now the plus or minus on sine and cosine aren't going to matter so much because of the fact that uh, we um, we are going to have sines and cosines and those will go all the way from minus one to plus one. But I am, as promised, going to jump over here to Desmos and I am going to go ahead and type in there a parenthesis and then my x was 3 minus 3 square root of 2 cosine. I will use t instead of theta. And then minus 2, minus 2 square root 3 sine theta, or sine t. Okay, so you should be able to see on my graph here that I only got a little bit of a circle but that's because my t's went from zero to one. I'll go from minus pi to pi, and now I get the whole circle. If I just wanted a part of the circle, then I would adjust it to be whatever <coughs> particular, um, particular variations that we might have there, all right? So parameterizing ellipses shouldn't be too rough and then I'm going to take that other example that you saw, and I'm going to come back over here, and we're going to figure out how to parameterize a hyperbola. Pretty similar, okay? Screen mirroring, one, two, three, touch. It really does seem like if I count to three beforehand that it works better. All right, so we're going to parameterize this uh, this hyperbola here. And like before, we're going to have to complete the square. And that means factoring some stuff out there. And so y squared minus 2y. You might have noticed that I was tricky with that and chose my numbers so they worked nicely. Sometimes your numbers don't work nice and you just have to live with it. But we're adding four, which means we really added eight. And we're adding one, which means we really subtracted three. So you have two times x minus two squared minus three times 
uh, y minus 1 squared is equal to 15 minus 3 is 12. Okay. Now, at this point, you can see that it's got the x part, <clears throat> excuse me, it's got the x part um, having a positive coefficient and the y part having a negative coefficient. Up until we got this over here to be positive, we didn't really know that for sure. This will come back to haunt us when we are doing our uh, three-dimensional sorts of things because we have to keep track of, believe it or not, the number of pluses and minuses uh, to be able to tell our shapes. All right, so now if we come along here, x minus 2 over the square root of 6 needs to be cosh t and y minus 1 over 2 needs to be cinch t. So our x is going to end up being 2 plus the square root of 6 cosh t. I am just realizing in the previous page I screwed up my signs, my plus or minuses, and I am going to go back and fix that, but I'm not going to bore you all by making you watch it. Okay. All right, so bear in mind that we're going to uh, have those as a parameterizations. And then I'm going to jump over here to my Desmos uh, in uh, another window. And the reason that I do this, I do my Desmos on the, uh, on the computer screen instead of the the iPad screen is that it's just faster to type, okay? So we had this being our x was 2 plus square root of 6 cosh t, and then our y was 1 plus 2 cinch t, okay? And I'm going to turn off the old one and you can see that you've just got a little section of the hyperbola like before. You want to do a symmetric interval to get a piece of it. And then you might want to go ahead and go minus 10 to 10. You really don't need very much <clears throat> um, to get a pretty wide interval. If I go from minus 5 to 5, that's going to be out of the side of where you can see. Hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine are in fact going to be um, uh, are in fact going to be exponential functions. All right, now here is the thing that's going to make a difference. I'm going to put in a minus here and um, <clears throat> and that difference of the minus or plus cosh is going to uh, going to do you know, the two pieces of it. Now, there is an alternative that you can do. And I am going to paste this here. And I'm going to turn these two off. All right, this one's weird. Because your, uh, your regular, circular, secant, and tangent have a nice relationship that looks a lot like hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine, you can actually come in here and say secant t and tan t and get the same sort of thing. Now remember, you have discontinuities on, uh, on those at minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So when we say minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, we'll actually get the whole graph. But if I went ahead and had two cycles of it, it'll draw the other portion. So there might be an argument for why you might use the hyperbolic secant and hyperbolic tangent. I'm sorry, the secant and tangent instead of hyperbolic sine and cosine. Just because you're uncomfortable with hyperbolic sine and cosine, and you kind of know about the secant and tangent. 
The problem is because of those infinite discontinuities that happen there, you may end up getting pieces that are stretched and just sometimes it'll make the graph look weird. Okay. But I want you all to be aware that those are two options there that uh, accomplish what we are looking to accomplish with parameterizing. And now I'm going to jump back. This is going to be a long one. I'm going to jump back to uh, looking at the iPad. You know, there's a there's another way to do this where I wouldn't have to jump around quite as much, but oh well. So we are going to look at parameterizing a plane. Uh, um, oh, brother. So, uh, but in particular, this is going to uh, look at a plane region. I should put the word region here. Okay, so we're just going to do a piece of a plane, not the whole plane. So when you take a look at these uh, vertices that you got here, I just went and generated them uh, in such a way that they would actually constitute a parallelogram. And it will turn out that the vector that goes from here to here and the vector that goes from here to here, if you add them together, would in fact take you to the fourth point. So in a sense, that fourth point isn't super necessary for what we need, okay? But I'm going to find my u vector by just saying, how do I get from uh, this point to that point? And so if I'm going from negative four to negative six, I had to subtract two. If I'm going from negative nine to negative two, I had to add seven. If I'm going from 10 to negative eight, woo, I had to subtract 18. Then the other one here, I am going from negative four to negative five, so I had to subtract one. From negative nine to seven, I had to add 16. And from 10 to negative three, I had to subtract 13. Okay, so my parameterization, I'll use the variables S and T here because I've used U and V to mean, to mean vectors, right? But my S times the vector U plus my T times the vector V and um, both S and T are going to be values between 0 and 1. And that way, if I need to go across halfway and up halfway, I can coordinate those and get, you know, a point in the middle, right? If I, instead of that, wanted to cut this in half, right, instead of having the whole parallelogram there, I just wanted half of it. I could say I want S to be less than or equal to one and um, T to be less than or equal to one minus S or flip it and do, do it the reverse way. Okay. So there are options to actually get just pieces. And in fact, if you wanted some weirdly shaped thing, you could just replace that S with some, some function of S. So you can get different shapes, All right? So um, with regard to this, I'm going to share screen again, but instead of Desmos, I am going to, where the hell did I put that CalcPlot 3D? Yep, I'm going to share with you all the CalcPlot 3D and with it, I'm going to do a parametric surface. And the parametric surface, I'm going to have to define x and y and z on. It predefines that I have to use u and v to mean the, um, the parameters here. So I am just going to go down there. And remember, the vectors I got were minus 2, 7, minus 18 and minus 1, 16, thir minus 13. So I am going to start at the point minus 4, 
minus 9, 10. And then the minus 4, I'm going to have to say uh, minus 2u and minus 1v. I think I have to put multiplication signs here. I'm not sure, but oh, nope, I don't. OK, whatever. Then for the uh, y part, I started at negative 9, and I have to say plus 7u and plus 16v. And then on the z part, I started at 10, and I have to say minus 18u and minus 13v. OK, those were randomly generated numbers and stuff. Um, so uh, they ended up being kind of messy, all right? And I'm going to take away that and then make it draw this. And I'll have to zoom out so that we can see the section of the parallelogram. Wow, that's fairly big there. But yeah, you can see that you've just got a parallelogram that's lying in a particular plane. OK. So um, that tells you how to go about parameterizing a plane. So the surfaces we really need to take a look at are the quadric surfaces. Go to your textbook, look in the table of contents. There's a section in chapter 12, 13, I don't know, uh, titled quadric surfaces. And it details these basic surfaces that all have very similar looking equations to them. Uh, and then it tells you nothing about parameterizing them, but I can show you how to parameterize them and it's not super hard, okay? The main thing to remember is that we're going to try to look for something where it's circles and hyperbolas, okay? Just that's, that's our goal. So, Let's take a look at an example. Oh, and we have to complete the square. Yeah. Let's look at an example here on the iPad, and then we will try to get a graph of it. Okay, so we're parameterizing 16x squared plus 9y squared. You can read. Okay, like before, we're going to complete the square. So I'm going to come over here and say 16 times x squared. It's a minus 32x, so I have a minus 2x, and then plus 9 times the y squared. There's a minus 36y, so now I'll have a minus 4y plus 16z squared. And, oh, z squared doesn't have anything, so that'll just be by itself. And I'm going to move the 36 over here. I have to add 1. That means I added 16. And then I have to add 4, that means I have to add 36. And now I have 16 times x minus 1 squared plus 9 times y minus 2 squared plus 16z squared is equal to 16. Okay, so when I divide, I will have x minus 1 squared. The 16s will cancel. I'm going to put it over 1 so that it's nice and neat. Plus... Uh, y minus 2 squared over, that doesn't cancel, so I'm going to write it as 16 ninths, and you'll see why, and then plus z squared divided by 1 equals 1, okay? So, uh, all of those are positive. We don't have to do anything weird. You can, in fact, treat this as though it was x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. You should remember that for polar coordinates that you could do this. Rho, man, do I remember this? Cosine theta sine phi. Rho sine theta sine phi. And rho cosine phi. Okay. We have a sphere that has a radius of 1, so we just assign rho to be 1. So now for x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1, 
we know what to let X and Y and Z be, okay? But we don't exactly have that. We instead have X minus one over one needs to be cosine theta sine phi. And Y minus two over four thirds needs to be sine theta sine phi. And um, well, I guess the Z is all right. It's gonna, gonna be just the cosine phi. Now, I'm gonna do algebra. Y'all can do that with no problem. But here's a sticker. I have to type it into something that's going to assume U and V are my parameters. So I have to change it and come to X equals one cosine U sine V, Y equals two plus four thirds sine U sine V and Z equals cosine V. And then you have to remember that the U was theta and the V was phi, okay? If you switch those around, you need to switch around your ranges there. It's just, they're set up to do that nicely, okay? If you need to have just a portion of, uh, a portion of your sphere instead, then, you know, you would make the appropriate adjustments uh, uh, to the ranges, all right? So now, Share screen, jumping back over here, and uh, I am making x be one plus cosine u sine v, the y to be two plus four thirds uh, sine sine B, and the Z to be just cosine. And my U zero to two pi, and my V to be zero to pi. All right, turn it off, turn it back on. Suddenly we've got a sphere. Now you may notice that that sphere does not look very spherical. It looks kind of ellipsoidal. And I think that is just because, oh, yeah, no, that is totally appropriate, isn't it? Because the y direction that we had over here had a four thirds times it. If we, on the other hand, had had just a one in there instead, and we redraw it, it looks super duper spherical, right? But we had the four thirds. And that was the reason why it looks flatter in that direction, okay? Or longer in that direction, actually. So, all right. <clears throat> so, uh, coming back around here, now we're gonna tackle, <clears throat> uh, tackle a different surface. And so I'm sharing screen again. I am tempting fate every time I do this, I think. So, okay. so this one here, you can see that uh, you've got the positive over there on the right hand side, and we're trying to force it into the standard form that gets a one over on the right hand side. Okay, when you do that, you can, if you've dealt with these before, spot exactly what your shape is without having to graph it. So here I'm going to just have to divide by four and have four X squared minus Y squared over four minus four Z squared equals one. And then I'll write it as X squared over one fourth minus Y squared over four and minus Z squared over one fourth equals one, okay? So with respect to that, um, you when you have that being positive one over there and you get it in standard form, these 
down here all have meaning when you talk about ellipsoids to be uh, talking about the mi major and minor radii. But here we don't have them all being plus. We instead have two of them being minus. Okay. If you have minuses and pluses here, you are going to end up with something we refer to as a hyperboloid. And this one, because it has two minus signs, there's kind of a mnemonic here, it's going to have two sheets for it. Okay. All right. I am going to take, yeah, I'm going to take these and shove them over here to the side so that we have a little bit of room. And then we're going to work out here that I need to have my x, I started to say x squared, but my x over one half, just taking the square root there, is going to need to be equal to something. And then I'm going to uh, going to end up doing something kind of kind of mm, tricky here, I guess. So the y over two equal to something, and the z over the one half being equal to something. Okay. So <clears throat> the pieces here that are minus are going to end up getting a cinch. Remember how, how we had x squared minus y squared equals one and the x was cosh and the y was cinch. So because these are getting a minus, they're gonna have a, a hyperbolic sign and this one will get a hyperbolic cosine. So I'm just gonna come through and say hyperbolic cosine t, um, we might as well go ahead and make it u, right? And then the other two get a hyperbolic sign. Then um, breaking these two apart, the y and the z, we're going to have them being doing doing something kind of circular. They're really going to behave as though, well, I mean, let me let me uh, yeah, let me temporarily erase here and have, um, yeah, that's not gonna make a lot of sense. Yeah, well, whatever. If I temporarily erase there, and if you didn't worry about the fact that they're negative, that kind of goofs things up, I know. But uh, if they'd both been positive, <clears throat> then you would be looking at them together and saying, oh, that's gonna be an ellipse. So with what we're doing here, we're going to be thinking about those in terms of having an ellipse. And so we will go ahead and say one of them to be a cosine V and the other to be sine V. And it doesn't really matter so much which, which is which. Okay. But now because the U has to do with hyperbolic sine and cosine, we let it go like minus one to one. And because the uh, sine and cosine have to do with trig functions, we'll let them go zero to two pi. If you wanna go minus pi to pi, that works too, okay? Sometimes it's nice to have kind of symmetric intervals there. Well, in any case, once you have that idea in mind, then we're going to uh, take this and just solve for the x and take the y and just solve for the y. And can you guess? Yeah, the z we're gonna take and solve for the z. Okay. And then we are gonna jump over to our graphing utility and we're just gonna graph that puppy. All right. So, uh, I'm gonna come in here and for the X, what did I say? One half, so I'll have 0 0.5 times cosh U. And then for the Y, two cinch U uh, cosine V. And then for the Z, one half cinch of U sine of v, okay? And this, the uh, 
U's, we're going to go minus 1 to 1. And then the V's, we said 0 to 2 pi. Take that away, put it back. And you see we've got a very flat looking sort of disk there. Okay. So what I really need to do is to add another graph there. And the second one, I'm going to uh, uh, copy things across for. And all right. And then for it, because we have the cosh being positive on the other one, we're going to have this one being negative. And then we got to make sure that our, I should have, I should have reversed U and V there. And add zero, two pi, and 30 steps. All right, and so, all right. And so you can see there that they're stretched out in one direction and they're kind of flat looking, but we have these two surfaces. If I went ahead and told them to go, told one to go to minus 10 to 10 and redrew it, you can see that it would go really super dang big. But I think minus one to one is enough of it to get the idea. All right, so hyperboloid of two sheets. So can you guess that there's also going to be a hyperboloid of one sheet? And I think that's the next example that we got to look at. Yeah, it is. All right, so stop that sharing and jump over to the other one. And screen mirror, one, two, three, go. Yay. All right, so this one, we're going to parameterize it. And then we're going to get a graph of it and we'll see how things go. So we will have nine times x squared. We had minus 54x, so it'll be minus 6x. Leave some space. And then minus the, oops, we'll leave, some, leave that there, minus the y squared. And it had a minus 4y, so now it'll be a plus 4y. Leave some space. Minus 9 and the z squared is a minus 54, so it'll turn into a plus 6z, and we'll leave some space, and there was nothing over there on the other side, so yay! So we have to add 9, that means that we have to add 81, we have to add 4, that means we have to subtract 4, and then we have to add 9, meaning we have to subtract 81, so things cancel, and I have this. So you might say, oh, looks like he's got a hyperboloid of uh, two sheets because, you know, I've got two minuses. But we have to divide and dividing out that minus four is going to change that. We end up with minus the x minus three squared over uh, I'll write it as 4 ninths, and then this one will turn out to be plus, and this one will turn out to be plus. Okay, so we have only one, uh, we don't have only one um, uh, negative there, and so that means we're actually going to have a hyperboloid of one sheet. I got to tell you, I really kind of like the shape that the hyperboloid of one sheet draws. It just kind of looks neat to me. But we're going to write out our parameterization here, our x and our y and our z. And so our x will end up with a 3 plus 2 thirds, something, something, something. And the z is, or the y is a minus 2 plus two times something, and the z is a minus three plus two thirds times something. Now we have to fill in the somethings. 
okay? So the ones that were positive are gonna get the cosh. The ones that are negative get the cinch. So cosh T, cosh T. I said T, didn't I? But we're using a U on the drawing thing. And I said one thing and then wrote another. And gosh, all right, the ones that are positive, right? And then the two that have the same sign, you're going to break up uh, with a cosine V and a sine V. And uh, um, it doesn't really matter which one's which, okay? And remember that that means that our U having to do with hyperbolics is in a symmetric interval, minus one to one, and our V just has to have a period of two pi. So it can go zero to two pi, or hey, you know what? Just for the sake of variety, let's go minus pi to pi on that. Okay, see if it makes any difference. So stop and uh, turn this thing off and, oh, hi there. I left my face on the screen and I did not mean to do that. So not that I'm hiding from the law or anything, just uh, that I didn't uh, intend to be there. Minus three plus two thirds cosh sine v. U is hyperbolic. Okay, yeah, that's the same same setup as before. So we get the drawing. All right, and it's drawn kind of off there to the side. So that's going to be somewhat annoying. But um, notice that. The axis that would go down through the middle of it would be parallel to the x-axis, okay? And the x-axis is the one that gets a hyperbolic sign. So that's something that you can spot on these sometimes, All right? So uh, hyperboloids of one sheet and two sheets are something that that are relatively straightforward. But now we're going to look at something that seems like it sits between the two. In fact, it's kind of nice to maybe create an animation sometimes that uh, shows taking a hyperboloid of two sh of one sheet and taking that neck at the middle of it and shrinking it down. And then right at the middle, you have a place where it kind of clamps off to a single point and you have two intersecting cones. And then when you pull them apart and turn into a hyperboloid of two sheets, it kind of makes a nice continuous sort of animation. I've done that before when I had access to Mathematica, but I am not gonna try it with, uh, with the uh, programs that we've got available to us right now. It's kind of neat, but it's, it took me a day with Mathematica at hand, and I'm pretty skilled with Mathematica. So with uh, Python, I could expect to spend a week doing it. So I don't care that much. Oh, look, I could show, share you my screen with the problem where we try to figure out the cone. One, two, three, go. All right, so like before, we're going to look at it and try to complete the square. So 9x squared and the minus 54 becomes minus 6x. 
and then minus and the y squared and the plus 4y. This is looking pretty similar, isn't it? And then the minus 9 and the z squared. And so it becomes minus 6z. And it's equal to 4 over there. So we add the 9, add 81. We add the 4, we subtract the 4. We add the 81, we subtract the 81. So we end up with 9 times x minus 3 squared minus y plus 2 squared and then minus 9z. Um, z, and I, I lost track of where I was going, sorry, uh, z minus 3 squared, and that's all equal to zero. So if you're looking in that section about quadric surfaces, when you end up with the zero over there, then we have something we refer to as an elliptical cone. And so what you end up doing then is taking and putting the stuff that's negative together on one side, like so. And now it's going to have a particular form that suggests this uh, uh, conical sort of thing. Uh, like if you had z squared equals x squared plus y squared, which you could rewrite as z equals r or z equals plus or minus r, I guess. And, and then if you did a drawing of that, it would come out fairly straightforward. But if you're thinking along those terms, then what you gotta do is to take this part over here, think about it with the r stuff, and this part over here, and think about it with the z stuff. So it's kind of convenient if we divide out that nine, okay? So that uh, this portion here is kind of solved for. And then you'd have x minus three squared equals, and now y plus two squared over nine, plus I'm gonna put z minus three squared over one, okay? So now you're going to have um, the y, I said y and wrote x, try it again, y plus 2 over 3 is going to be equal to r times cosine theta or t. Since we've got to have u's and v's, I'm going to say u cosine v, and then the z minus 3 over 1 is going to be u sine v. <clears throat> because now, if you work out the algebra of that, this x minus 3, you're going to end up just having the u. Okay? That can be plus or minus u. So we will have x equals 3 plus u, y equals uh, negative. 2 plus 3u cosine v, z equals 3 uh, plus u sine v. And for your u, I'm going to tell you to make it about both plus and minus, and your v do this, the full rotation, okay? So making the u be both plus and minus is like having an r being both plus and minus. And that then allows you to draw two portions, both the upper and the lower portions of a cone. And so I'm gonna have to go back there and say three plus u and Minus 2 plus 3u cosine v plus u sine v. And 
my range is still work. Turn it off, turn it back on. <clears throat> and you can see what the piece that we ended up with is a cone <clears throat> with the axis of symmetry um, blah, kind of going in the direction of this X axis here. Okay. So, so you have to be able to spot when you have a zero over there on one side that you're going to get a cone and know that that's a special case and that it's handled differently. Okay. All right. Um, I forget how many more of these I've got. Um, I'll get, I'll get it. Yeah, I've only got like three more to go. So bear with me here. We are going to parameterize another one here, another quadrant surface here. That one, two, three, go. Yay. This time we only have one of them. We have one of them that's not being squared. So what you will do is to solve for that one. And um, divide out there so that we have x squared over one and z squared over four, okay? And now essentially you're gonna do the same strategy we did with the cone. We're gonna have the x over one, the r cosine, no, it's not r, it's u cosine v, and the z over two be the u sine v. And then the y, you just go ahead and uh, <clears throat> do the square and put them together, and it will turn out to be u squared. Okay, so our solution here, u cosine v, y equals u squared, z equals 2u sine v, and our u, we're going to do 0 to 1. You can make it larger than that if you want to. It doesn't, doesn't matter that much. And then the v, 0 to 2 pi. Okay, the reason that we don't bother with the negative is that since you square it, you're actually going to end up uh, drawing the same thing twice. If you do that, I'm going to, I'm going to try on this to do the first uh, thing that I just said. And then we'll go back and see if it looks different. Uh, put in negative one, all right? I think y'all can see that fairly well there. Let's zoom in a bit more, okay, so that you can see. Now, I'm gonna try changing it to go minus one to one, and we'll see whether it turns out to look exactly the same. Keep your eye on it. Ooh, wow. It looks different, but it's super subtle. So I'm gonna change it back. Watch what happens. See how some of the lines appear in the zero to one, but not in the minus one to one? That's because of how it's getting broken up, okay? And uh, some, some, of, uh, some of what goes on there, you may get some places uh, where um, where a surface gets written above where the juncture of two surfaces was before. I've seen this in particular happen if you go zero to two pi, zero to two pi on the U and V when you're parameterizing a sphere because, uh, because of where the round offs end up landing at sometimes it will make the sphere look like all jagged and stuff. So, um, yeah, more than anything, you just have to have uh, done a bunch of these and kind of gotten some experience with them. So, all right, uh, another example here, and this one is parameterizing kind of an odd shape. And there's one, 
along these lines in the classwork. Not exactly like this, but it's something that's a little bit weird. So if you think about parameterizing the portion of x squared plus y squared inside of x squared plus z squared equals two, I kind of drew a front and side view of that, and that might not help so much. So it occurs to me that I've got a tool sitting right here beside me where we can do this pretty easily. Um, x squared plus y squared, you will have the um, you'll have it be u, I'm sorry, x squared plus y squared equals one, then you would end up having just cosine theta, sine theta, if it was in the plane. So you're gonna go ahead and say uh, cosine v, sine v, and then for the z we'll do um, v, zero or we'll do the u all right now the other one uh we're going to have it be x squared plus z squared equals one so this one will have the u part being in the y direction instead and then we're going to have to have uh, a square root of two cosine u and a square root of two cosine. And I think that was okay. For some reason it does not want to draw it. Okay. Well, that's super. All right. Can you draw it if I? Oh, oh, hmm. it's complaining about this for some reason. It does not like square root of two. It was fine with the square root of two earlier. Okay, 1.41. 1.41. Pull that down. It won't. Great. Okay. So you have a thin tube and you have a thicker tube that's cutting through it. So you'll have rounded tops and bottoms there, okay? And you just have to imagine it because I can't make the computer do what I want it to. No idea, so. All right, so we're going to Look here on ours. One, two, three, go. All right, so we need to parameterize the portion of x squared plus y squared equals one inside there. So the x and the y part, because we have to be on that surface, are actually easy to do. We will say cosine u and sine u. Okay, could have done v just as easily. But now the z, you need to make it go up and down inside of this. So we're going to think here with this uh, x squared plus uh, z squared equals 2. We're going to think about uh, can I do cosine uh, squared u plus my z squared and get two there. So you know that you could have your z squared being equal to um, then two minus cosine squared u. I guess that could also be one plus sine squared u, but it doesn't, that doesn't really help too much, right? But those are gonna be your cutoffs. So what I'm actually going to do is to make my z be v, okay? And then I'm going to say minus square root two minus cosine squared u is less than v is less than 
the plus square root two minus cosine squared u. Okay. Now, unfortunately, there is no way for me to accomplish that with the uh, with the drawing program that I've got. Even if uh, even if I were able to get it working right now, um, because of the fact that it only has your limits for the u and the v being equal to constants, right? So what you've got to visualize on this is maybe if we looked at Desmos, I think we can do that. And so jumping over here to Desmos. All right, we're gonna kill all the stuff we already had. And we had our Z or our V going between minus square root two minus cosine, I'm gonna put x, and I'm gonna put the square after because eh, this doesn't quite understand what's going on there. Um, the notation for Desmos it just does not like it when you do it otherwise. So, eh, so that's what's going on with my z values, that they're going between these two places here. And if I go ahead and have my uh, my x stuff, which is was the u and what I wrote before, go from zero to two pi, I could say x equals zero, and then I can say x equals two pi. Okay, and so you could see what we've got drawn there, and if you wanted a better illustration of it. I think I can do this. I can come in here and have less than or equal to one is less than or equal to, oh yeah, yeah, right? And then for my x's, I can come in here and I can say um, zero is less than or equal, less than or equal to x, less than or equal to Two, 2 pi, okay? So, so you can see those two intersections there. That's, I think I chose a color that was too, uh, too dark there, maybe orange. Yeah, that's not great. But maybe if I choose that to be purple. Yeah, that's, that's a little better there, okay? So then you have to think about rolling that around to make that surface. All right, and then I'm going to hit the stop share there. Um, I had one more example, but I'm tired, okay? And so um, if I get time later, I'll show you how to parameterize a torus, which is kind of a neat, kind of a neat problem, but not strictly necessary for what we need, okay? All right, and I'm going to let you go at that. This has been a super long video. I'm sorry. So.